we're told, oh, you can't speak up about politics, right? They've given up on me. <laughs> we got to address the suburban women problem because it's real. Welcome to the Suburban Women Problem, a podcast from Red, Wine, and Blue. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jasmine Clark. I'm Amanda Weinstein. I'm Rachel Vindman. And you're listening to the Suburban Women Problem. This week, Red, Wine, and Blue announced some exciting news. We're expanding our on-the-ground organizing into the state of Virginia. And we're not just going in for one election. We're going to have organizers on the ground year-round. Two years ago, we talked about Glenn Youngkin and how he used fears about critical race theory to win the governor's race in Virginia. And schools have been at the center of this drummed up culture war ever since. So I'm excited to see the good work that we're about to do in Virginia. I got the chance to talk to Penny Blue, Red Wine and Blue's new program director in Virginia. And before that, we'll be joined by Julie Shepard, a mom in Virginia who's been an advocate for her school board and for military families. But before we get into all that, what have we been seeing in the news and what's been going on in our group chat? Well, um, I think most people in the country are having a better week than Donald Trump this week. What do you guys think? I know I am. I'm doing good. (laughs) Yeah. Every time I'm like, oh, man. Oh, no. I stubbed my toe. I'm like, yeah, but that's still better than what Donald Trump has going on right now. My bathroom looks way better. Can I just say? (laughs) Like the chandelier with the cheap shower curtain and the boxes and boxes of classified material. My bathroom is looking top notch right now. Shower curtains without a bathtub always are just such a nightmare with the water goes everywhere. And that's all I could see (laughs) when I saw that shot. I mean, I then looked at all the classified boxes of classified documents literally stored in a shower and a bathroom. Um, You know, I, I have to say, What are the things I struggle with? And what do you guys think? Like, do you think most Americans understand? I mean, Amanda, you were in the military. You totally understand security clearances. Jasmine, uh, you're a lot more plugged in than most people. And I don't, like, I'm really afraid of this, like, just these false equivalency of like, oh, well, Biden had classified documents too. And I'm like, yeah, but not our nuclear program. And also whatever documents he had, as soon as someone alerted him, hey, you might have something that you shouldn't have. He's like, all right, let's fix this. Yeah, I think what a lot of people don't understand is this was not like the first option. This is like the last resort. Like So many other things happened before we got to this point. And it was like so many chances were given, honestly, more chances than a lot of other people would have gotten for very similar scenarios. Yep. But, you know, people were giving him the opportunity to make it right and to come up with the things that were missing. And along the way, it's just all deception after deception, telling people to sign off on things that they knew weren't there. You know, those are things that, Again, other people wouldn't have gotten away with. And I think that he really has skirted the law for so long that he really doesn't understand accountability. He doesn't care. Yeah, he doesn't. I mean, I don't think he thinks that rules apply to him. And even down here in Georgia, so the Georgia GOP recently had their uh, convention Mm -hmm. and it's a lot of what's divisiveness, honestly, between Republicans in Georgia who are like going down the MAGA train track versus other Republicans that are like, I, we want to just be normal again. And so there really is a divide Mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. And so the GOP has kind of jumped onto the Trump train Good luck. Yeah. and, you know, they had him there. And honestly, like, even still, like this man is about to walk into a courthouse this week. This We're recording on a Monday, so it hasn't happened yet. But prior to that, he's still going around the country on tour, being able to spew his lies. And I mean, other people just don't get that luxury. So I don't know if the American people understand, because I think it really depends on where people consume their news yeah, as to whether or not they really Mm -hmm. understand what's going on. Agree. I mean, I think this is information that protects our country. It's also information that protects our military members. And to be so careless with that information is to be careless with Americans and our country. 
It's completely unacceptable and it's completely unprecedented that we have ever seen anything like this in our country. And it is really great to see the justice system work yeah. and to see some form of accountability. But what's that going to look like to you? Can I ask, what, what do you think accountability will look like from this scenario? I got to be honest. I'm already excited that we're seeing an indictment. Like to me, I'm like, that is a win pop some bubbly and let's just mm-hmm. celebrate the indictment. I am ready to celebrate that. And these are very serious allegations. Even Bill Barr was on Fox news. Yeah. Saying if even half of this is true, he's toast. He is done. I mean, I am feeling very happy about the justice and the accountability here. And we're seeing a lot more accountability than I gave our systems credit for almost. Yes. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> Like with this, and I don't know if that's bad or good. I don't really don't know, but I feel more accountability with this. And even with um, like the Supreme Court also struck down Alabama's congressional map saying, no, you can't do this. You're completely drawing maps to disenfranchise black voters. And the Supreme Court struck this map down and you gerrymandered this map. And you had Chief Justice John Roberts and Justice Brett Kavanaugh agree with the liberals you know, to be in the majority here, like that is accountability to support, you know, the Voting Rights Act that I was also not expecting. I really like the accountability. I don't think that most people were expecting it. In fact, I think, you know, if you were in the voting rights space, you're basically like, you know, bracing for this decision and and kind of bracing for the worst Mm -hmm. based on all of the disappointments we've experienced over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. I think we were kind of preparing for another disappointment. Mm -hmm. And so it is very surprising and it should have a ripple effect in other states across the country that also have some pending litigation dealing with you know, congressional maps and uh, gerrymandering and disenfranchisement uh, of Black voters or voters of color um, in violation of the Voting Rights Act. So I, for one, am very excited. And I I hope that it really reinforces in 2024, when we have to go back to the ballot box, that what happened in 2022, it would be unfortunate to to learn that they kind of stole a House majority through gerrymandered maps, but I hope we can at least write it in 2024 and get back on track and get something that is actually representative of our country's, you know, our our feelings about who they want to represent them. I mean, what I would like to see more accountability with is, I mean, so we're talking about the federal level and, you know, I guess at the state now too, with, you know, this Alabama thing, but at the local level, I think we have seen very little accountability for groups like Moms for Liberty. Right. Like they are going in and completely destroying what our education system is. Like, I don't need to be hyperbolic, but it's not unlike January 6th. They are literally, literally trying to tear down our education system from the inside. Yeah. And I think it's interesting and telling that the Southern Poverty Law Center officially classified Moms for Liberty Liberty as an anti-government extremist organization, just as they classify the Oath Keepers who were at January 6th. They listed, wasn't it 11 groups um, as being, you know, met their threshold. And I think it's really important that we call this what it is. Stop mm-hmm. acting like these are rational actors. Stop acting like they are promoting things that people, regular people believe in. That's not what they're doing. It's not a group that's just know coming to leads. represent. Exactly. They're not right. just coming to represent like your neighbors. That's not what they're coming to do. They're coming in from outside. They have an agenda. They are teaching this agenda to people, co-opting people in these individual communities and then trying to act from there. They are not coming as a grassroots organization to raise an issue that already exists in the community. You know, I, I'm sure many of our listeners know moms, you know, who are associated with Moms for Liberty. And whether you want to counter them or not is your decision. But I definitely think this is something you need to talk about and educate yourself about right. so that you can at least talk to your friends and make sure that no one is coming at them from these groups and trying to, you know, convince them. Because whether or not you proselytize is your business, but be for sure that Moms for Liberty does do that. 
So the important thing is that we can like kind of educate our friends. I think it is very strategic to name something like moms for something. No, absolutely. And then let's name it something that is, you know, seen as a good thing. Yeah, we like liberty. So mm-hmm. then people who don't want to dig a little bit deeper, mm-hmm. they're like, why would you go up against the moms? Also, when you put moms in the name, it it's disarming for a lot of people. And they're like, oh, no, they can't be that bad. We're talking about a bunch of parents mommies i don't know if you if you if you talk to my 12 year old i think should be like get me away <laughs> from that group that's true yeah <laughs> but i think it's just like society wise yes. like if people aren't paying attention and you just see something named moms for yeah something that's true you might not realize that this is an extreme uh you know this is extremist group that is peddling really dangerous rhetoric Because it doesn't sound scary. Mm -hmm. Earlier, Rachel, you asked about like how much do people understand about the Trump stuff? I think even with this, this is why we have to educate ourselves to be able to talk about it. So people understand our opposition to the dangers of this group. I think that's why I love Red, Wine and Blue, because we actually platform people who are really, truly speaking for the majority the 97%. of the moms in the in the community, not this very small, but very vocal uh, minority. And so that is why I'm really excited to bring on our troublemaker today. So Julie is a mom in Virginia who's been an incredible advocate for military families and for public schools. So Julie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. So you do so much, but one thing you're especially dedicated to is supporting public schools. And I love that. Um, So could you tell our listeners about that advocacy work and why it's so important to you? Absolutely. I'm a daughter of a public school teacher. So it starts all the way back from my mom. And my children have both have special needs. They're twice exceptional. And I've that's sort of what got me started with that. Um, being a military family, we've moved around multiple times and it's really difficult. And we know from research and data, the populations of students that struggle the most um, when they're moving are students with disabilities and gifted students. And so my kids fall into both of those buckets. And so my time as a PTA leader then helped me propel myself plus the um, my own children's issues with moving. Around, I, I love that. I I have so many friends who are in similar circumstances, and they know more about public education and what all the ins and outs than most people I know. Just excellent resources. It's because they've done the work themselves, um, mostly out of a need and necessity, but they share that with others. And so I love that you do that, Julie. Thank you. We had spent a long time in Fair- the Fairfax County area, and that's when I was a PTA leader. And then we had to move. We had to move to San Diego, and it was really difficult. And when I came back, then I had then a, a rising junior and uh, an eighth grader. And so what I learned was, like, even though I came back to the same community that I left, the needs were still not being met for the community, for military families. And we are in. In, um, an area with a lot of military families. So I actually worked with the school. I started a um, military f- families committee within the side of the PTSA uh, to help welcome these families to the community. And that work got picked up and I was asked to set up a military families committee for the entire county. Um, But so that's how I found my way into working with school board candidates and helping get good quality candidates elected onto the school board. And, you know, one of those things, and Rachel, I believe you're, you have a military background, right? Military family. Mm -hmm. So we're told, oh, you can't speak up about politics, right? They've given up on me. (laughs) Right. Of course. Right. But like, you know, I'm, you know, young spouse Mm -hmm. moving overseas Mm -hmm. and everyone, you know, oh, well, you can't say anything about this and don't speak up. And women especially are told not to do this anyway. Right. Oh, it's not polite. You don't talk about politics. Mm -hmm. But look at what happens when we don't talk about politics. Right. Oh, Julie, you're speaking my language. This is something I talk about all the time. (laughs) Yeah. 
over time, I learned that like, you know, we can't, we can't be quiet anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm my own person. And of course, my service member has rules that he has to follow, but I don't have to follow those rules. I love it. I I have, I, I was never, I never received a prestigious military spouse of the year award. I do have several friends that have, um, but you did last year, you received the Hampton Roads military spouse of the year. Congratulations. I think that's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, And I just, I think it's a real testament to the work that you've done and that you told us about. And I know a lot is put on military spouses and a lot is expected for you to do without pay. And it's important work. And our military really does require a lot of work done by a lot of spouses out there. So you mentioned that you've moved around uh, as a military family and you are now so involved with your schools. And this was a big issue for Virginia and for Glenn Youngkin. Where do you see schools being an important piece of that puzzle as you know we try and get Virginia to move forward? Um, yeah, we know that this is the issue, right? And Yunkin and others in the Republican Party have created this playbook, and this is what's playing out now across the country. And it's being involved in education advocacy in the Commonwealth. I see the talking points. They they sur- they swirl the state, right? You know, you'll see hear it in this neighborhood. You'll hear it in this jurisdiction. You'll hear it in this jurisdiction. They'll try it out here. Does it take traction? And then they go around and around. And you know what we're basic we're really talking about is we're talking about our values. And that's why when we were mentioning before about being quiet, why we can't be quiet is because like it doesn't have to be partisan politics, right? We're talking about our values and what we want for our families. And I think it's really important as parents, especially, that we take back the narrative and like we are parents too parents do have rights and all of these things are out there and they just spin the messaging to fit what their narrative is so if we don't get more women specifically and mothers and parents involved in this and speak out they're going to continue to win the messaging war so that's what i think that this is they're not done with this that you're going to we're going to see this in the in the uh, presidential election across the country oh so agree when we talk about you know some of these groups that are really uh, insidiously moving their way up in the ranks politically and getting their messages amplified in the mainstream. One of their main targets lately have been LGBTQ um, and especially LGBTQ children. Uh, but this month is Pride Month. And so you have been very open about how your kids are part of the LGBTQIA rainbow. And so could you tell us a little bit more about them and how they inspire your work? Absolutely. So my oldest is 20, almost 21, and they didn't actually come out to me until after they graduated. They were going through a journey and discovery, and they had really great, safe teachers to go and talk to. And so I actually like to tell the story to other people who are uncomfortable about the notion of the school not telling the parents. And I share my perspective about why I was okay with them not telling me, even though we're a safe family and we're super supportive of both of our our kids. And it makes them stop and listen and pause and be like, oh, I understand. I said, don't, you know, my student was undergoing a lot of anxiety pre-COVID, right? And it was all due to not understanding who they were as a person with their gender, their sexuality, and feeling uncomfortable in their own skin. And I'm just so thankful to the staff at the school where my child was going that they had good support of people to talk to. And speaking of that, there is George Mason, right? So I'm sure you guys saw the governor spoke there and they were already home once the graduation happened because they weren't graduating. But, you know, they're very upset about what was going on with that. And they say, you know, mom, they want people like me to die. And so when your child tells you that, 
have to like really work harder to make sure that, you know, other people understand. I didn't understand before they came out to me that they were what non-binary meant, right? So it like, it's incumbent upon us to educate ourselves. Like, who cares what people want to be called? Like, just let them be comfortable, right? It's about being comfortable in their own skin. And then they're going to feel successful and supported and be able to be productive members of society. So since you, you know, you mentioned that about the attacks, I think that we have to talk about these stories and share, because if we're not going to do that, then, you know, not everyone has exposure. Absolutely. I have a question about just Virginia. You know, I, I lived in Virginia for the last election. We only moved um, at the beginning of March. I think that a lot of people have some buyer's remorse when it comes to Glenn Youngkin. I think he purported to be something else. And now they're seeing like his real agenda or I don't even know. If, I have a lot of questions if it's his real agenda or if it's real who he wants to be uh, because he thinks that's going to get him what he wants. I don't know. Um, doesn't really matter. But there's a lot of work to do in Virginia, I guess. Are you optimistic that people will then go back to making some more rational decisions? It's really important for Virginia to keep the Senate and, and flip the House. Absolutely. It is yes. the most yes. important thing other than the local school boards yeah. um, mm-hmm. that we need to be focused on. People need to be paying attention. They need to wake up. They need to go out and help knock doors for candidates that they believe in and their community. They need to give money. They need to do whatever they need to do because I don't want to live in a place that's not supporting my my children. So I think, you know, we've got to name what's going on. Yes, yes, I completely agree. And I think Red, Wine and Blue is going to really help that ha- had to happen. And not only that, but to help people in the community uh, to be able to educate their friends and give them, you know, power and tools to help Virginia keep the Senate. It is really important. In fact, my husband, uh, I am still, I still have a Virginia phone number and I still get calls uh, because I have donated to a lot of people. So um, he keeps asking me how many people, how many candidates we are going to max out our donation to. And I was like, well, I shouldn't say this publicly on a podcast, but everyone who calls me, that's what I'm going to do. I think I hear Rachel's phone ringing right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for being such a strong advocate, first for military families, also for public schools, also for our LGBTQ kids, just all around just being an amazing advocate. And I also want to say thank you so much for joining us today on the Suburban Women Problem. Thank you so much for having me. It was my pleasure to be here. I look forward to connecting with you all again in the future. Absolutely. You know, I... I have not been in the military. I know that both of you have some perspective of what it's like to be a military family. Amanda, you were in the military. Rachel, you are a military spouse. I do not have as much of a perspective. And so it's very interesting listening to you, Rachel, when you talk about it, but also listening to Julie and just hearing how there are some specific things that military families like really go through that a lot of people might not understand. And so it's great to have voices advocating for you, like what Julie is doing, because, you know, you just, there are so many people that just can't even relate because they don't have that perspective. Yeah. Even in, I mean, you know, in Virginia, they really try to do a good job because in the national capital region, there are so many military members and the schools try their best, but it it's still difficult. And it takes people like Julie who are willing to stand up in a non-confrontational way, not a Rachel Vindman way, <laughs> but to have people listen and to say these things and to tell people what we need and also to tell people how they can advocate for their children and explain it. It's just so critical. And I really, really applaud her. And I'm so glad we had her on. I agree. So actually, I think there's recent research that shows that like a, a lot of women's careers took a backseat to their husbands during COVID. Yeah, there was an article about that recently. Yeah, 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 there was. It was good and kind of infuriating. Yeah. And part of it was through the way we talked about women's work and what they do. But a lot of people don't realize like in the military, spouses, careers, it's almost mandated. You there's it's not even a choice. You have to take a back seat to your military spouse's careers. Mm-hmm. And what that does is it also puts a lot of spouses at risk. If you get a divorce, you have years of no experience under your belt that you didn't have a choice to have experience on your belt. So there's a lot of risk that comes with being a military spouse. 
And we rely a lot on military spouses to do actually the work of the military sometimes, like even boosting morale. Yep. And we rely on a lot of unpaid work from military spouses that we don't always recognize. And it's not unlike a lot of, a lot of the work women do is often unpaid, often important, but it just doesn't get recognized as much. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, especially today and without the draft, we don't have as many families that have experience with the military. So what that means is when you have a military family that moves in, you might not realize the type of inclusion that that family needs. So true. Like when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, like this is part of that. Like there's a lot that's part of that and inclusion, you know, it helps everyone and it can help people. We haven't even talked about in the conversation, which are military families. How do you make sure that someone brand new in our community is included and someone whose experiences in family life is different than my own are included? Absolutely. All right. So now we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll have my interview with Penny Blue. Can you believe it's been almost a year since Roe v. Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court? No matter whether you were shocked by the news or saw this coming, it still felt earth-shaking. Since that decision, so much has happened. Several states have voted to protect abortion access, communities have come together to help women get reproductive health care, progressives have won up and down the ballot while promising to fight for abortion access, and thousands of women have shared their stories of abortion. The momentum is on our side, and as we mark the one-year anniversary of the fall of Roe, we want to know, how have you found your voice? Our stories are the way we connect with each other, and you can submit yours at go.redwine.blue slash Dobbs, or by clicking the link in the show notes. Our guest today is an activist, a former school board member, and Red Wine and Blue's brand new program director in Virginia. She's also the author of A Time to Protest, Leadership Lessons from My Father, Who Survived the Segregated South for 99 Years. That's an amazing title. Penny Blue, thank you so much for joining me on The Suburban Women Problem. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm excited to be here today. Welcome to the Red Wine and Blue team. So happy to have you a part of the team. Uh, We're very excited to be expanding into Virginia. But before we get to that, I'd love to talk to you about your journey. Mm -hmm. Could you tell our listeners more about how you went from growing up on a farm to becoming an activist? It's very interesting. I, I was sharing with somebody my story because I feel like I've always been an activist because of the position uh, that I was put in as a child. Choice in the school system came to Virginia in 1965. Uh, Brown versus Board, of course, was 1954. So my parents sent my older siblings, who were in school at the time, to the historically all-white school. Mm. I started school in 1966, so I went the following year. So from summer school program that President Johnson put in place, which was called Head Start, to the fourth grade, I was the only black child in my class. And I remember uh, my niece was in the other fourth grade. And so when we would go outside to play, every day we were all that we would play jump rope and we'd be on the rope. And she and I were always the last ones to stand on the rope or to be chosen. So we always had to start turning the rope first. So I decided I am going to get that rope today. And the ropes were always in the back of the room in the closet. So I ran and got the rope and we went out to recess. And because I had the rope, the other kids wouldn't play with us. And then after they saw we were going to play anyway, they decided to come and play with us. And I put everybody on the rope. So that has been my life. Oh, wow. It started with jump ropes. I love that. Such an innocent way to say, look, I will be included. You will not leave me out. (laughs) And if you want to jump rope, then you're just going to have to play with me. I love it. I love it so much. (laughs) So you mentioned your father and it sounds like your father has really inspired you. So could you tell us more about him and why you wanted to write a book about him? Yes. Um, well, first, I'm number nine of 10 children. Oh, wow. So, so that's the norm. That was the norm for this area during that time. And my father used to tell us stories all the time. 
And I decided um, I, I'd retired from IBM and come back home because he was 95 at the time and needed some help. So I said, I need to document these stories because, you know, I need to publish them. So I set him down and my sister and I uh, had him retell the stories and we made certain, you know, the way we'd heard the stories. And I had I documented them all. And I said, well, in order to publish them, it's, it's not enough for a book. Plus, I need to contextualize the stories for them to really have meaning. And then once I put it all together, I said, well, actually, these are all stories of protest. And so, yeah, he was uh, instilling this in us without us actually even knowing it. And that's uh, a part of his legacy. And with my family is if we see something that's not right, we protest individually on a daily basis because that is what my mother and father did. Uh, they lived that way. And he told the stories. I love that. So uh, I would love, if you don't mind, to hear one of those stories, maybe one that really stands out to you as a story that your dad told you that you didn't really think of it as a protest story then, but you realized later on that it was. Um, well, one, I, I call it the wheat thrashing story. And um, back in the 40s and 50s, he and my grandfather used to farm together. And all the farmers would get together and thrash wheat. Uh, they called it a work and they would go from farm to farm to farm to thrash wheat. And the wives would prepare the lunch for when they would get to their farm. And the tradition was then in because of Jim Crow, even in private homes, they would break for lunch and the white farmers would go in and eat first. And once they finished eating, then the black farmers would go in and eat. And my dad uh, told the black farmers, you know, this doesn't make sense. You know, we're allowing other men to go into our homes and eat before we eat. So he decided, told them when they got to his home, that everybody was going to go in and eat together. So that's what he did. Oh, wow. And so everything went fine. But then the next year, when they got together for the round robin, it was the two white men that owned the um the equipment, and they set the round robin schedule. He wouldn't ask. He said, "Well, we're getting near our farm, but you haven't announced where you're going yet. So, is my house next?" And he said, "Well, Charles, you know, last year when we got to your house, you fed everybody together, and that's you know not how we operate. So, we're not going to do your farm this year." So, my father said he threw down his pitchfork and said, "If all I ever lose is a field of wheat." I'll be a rich man. Oh, wow. And my grandfather threw down his pitchfork and they walked off and everybody else continued the same. So that is what we were taught. And even if, hey, as my great nephew says, even if we stand alone, we stand for right. Oh, I love that. Even if I stand alone, I stand for right. Yes. I like that so much. Oh, wow. All right. So you mentioned education. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. So public education is an important issue everywhere, but it's especially significant in Virginia. Oh, yeah. The fury over, quote, parents' rights uh, that we're seeing right now can at least in part be traced back to Virginia, where Republican Glenn Youngkin won that governor's race back in 2021 after stoking fears about critical race theory. So as someone who has actually sat on the school board in Virginia... What's your perspective on all of this? Like from an insider perspective, how do you see that? Well, you'll find out that I am a lover of history because I truly believe if you know your history, it gives you a better perspective of what is going on today. And it just so happens that the scare with the CRT, to me, dates back to the time frame that I'm talking about, 1964 and 1965. Because that time frame, when Youngkin was running, it was a, a large amount of parents that came out to the school board. You know when the other largest time or time frame that parents came out to the school board was doing the integration uh, of, of the schools. And so it's a fear tactic. And the CRT was a fear tactic. And even while it was going on, I understood that it was a fear tactic to get people riled up at the school boards, but it was to get them to come out and vote within the overall environment uh, all the way down the ballot. So we had to see it for what it see it for what it was. It's very interesting. It's like history repeats itself. Yes. And 
If you don't know your history, then you might not recognize the patterns. But because you are very astute and you do know your history, you're like, oh, we've been down this road before. Before, I know exactly how this story goes. And it's interesting because I know even here in Georgia, when we were uh, having before the pandemic, most people couldn't even tell you when a school board meeting was exactly. or where the school board even met. Mm-hmm. They had no idea. Then all of a sudden we had standing room only school board meetings where everybody had something to say. Exactly. Exactly. And, and just to add to that, uh, I went back and looked at the voting and I was on the school board two terms before. And in the term that I lost, it was three times as many people that came out to vote for school board than they did before. So that means it was that many more people voting in general, which was the purpose of what Yunkin and those people were trying to do in the beginning. Exactly. Those numbers don't lie. Yes. (laughs) All right. So Juneteenth is coming up in a few days. And that's a federal holiday commemorating the emancipation of enslaved African-Americans. So I'm very curious, what does Juneteenth mean to you? Uh, I've been celebrating Juneteenth for a number of years, even before it became a holiday. I even mentioned it in the book um, that I, I wrote because I, I tell people anybody should be celebrating Juneteenth or the en- really the end of the Civil War. It should be African-Americans. Right. The reason I say that is because when the war started, the war was not about, uh, well, the war in the South was about to maintain slavery, but the war in the North was not to free the slaves. It was Frederick Douglass and others pushing the effort for us to participate in the war. And we made it about uh, freeing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's very meaningful to me. I've even portrayed Jane, which is Booker T. Washington's mother. Booker T. Washington was born here in Franklin County. We have a Juneteenth celebration at Booker T. Washington National Monument. And part of that celebration is the portrayal of when the Union soldier came to that particular farm and read the order that the enslaved were free. And I portrayed Jane in that. Oh, I love that. I love that. I mean, I love that you, how you bring the, up the point that the Civil War, while on one side, was really about uh, maintaining chattel slavery. The other side, it wasn't like the other side was, you, you know, against slavery. It was more of just against breaking away from the Union as a as a whole. It wasn't about us. And so we had to make it about freeing slaves. So, I, oh, that, you know, I've never really even thought about that perspective. I love that. You just gave me a little gem today. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to add, uh, like I said, uh, Frederick Douglass and others forced that issue and forced us, Link, uh, President Lincoln, to allow us to fight in the war. And when others were fighting in the war, they were fighting, let's say, for their state and et cetera, et cetera. We were fighting for our lives. Absolutely. Oh, man. That's a gem right there. That's a gem. I love that. <laughs> All right. So in your book, you also really uh, focus on standing up to injustice. It's a big theme in your book. Mm -hmm. Why is fighting for justice so important to you? And I think you kind of mentioned it a little bit, but just want to, you know, like, why is why is this fight that important? It's important because people actually had to be taught how to be slaves and they had to be taught how to be second class citizens. Now, when I say taught, I'm not sitting you down in the classroom, standing up teaching you. It may be taught by the way I treat you or by if you step out of line, then what happens to you? But you have to be taught that. And in my family, because of my the way my mom and dad lived their lives and the stories he told us, we were never taught how to be second class citizens. So to me, part of it is a matter of teaching people how not to be second-class citizens, because I believe in being a first-class citizen. I get in trouble for that quite a bit, you know, that good trouble, (laughs) because I don't know how to be a second-class citizen. (laughs) That's perfect. I mean, oh, that makes so much sense. And I wish more people didn't know. I wish more people hadn't been taught that or hadn't accepted 
that as their position in society and now have to be untaught or unlearn it. Yes. Because that is a whole other process. Mm-hmm. Wow. All right. All right. So you're inspiring me so much today, Penny. I just want to say that. <laughs> right. Thank you. All right. So with that, uh, it's been so great talking to you. But before we go, we always like to ask our guests a few rapid fire questions. Okay. So you ready? Yes. All right. Here we go. Question number one. What's your favorite thing about Virginia? It's beauty. Virginia is, I, I've been um, just about all over the country. And Virginia is a gorgeous state. Um, I didn't realize how gorgeous until I, I went away to school because I grew up here. So you just kind of used yeah, to you're in the it. beautiful <laughs> mountains and the trees. And I went to school in Hampton. And see, I love the water. And I, when I went there, I just thought it was so gorgeous. I didn't realize how beautiful the mountains were until after I was in school and came back to visit. So um, Virginia is just a gorgeous state. All right. So your dad got to meet Barack Obama, yes. which was such a powerful experience for him. Mm-hmm. So if you could meet any politician in person, who would it be? I would love to meet Cory Booker. Corey. Oh, yes. I love Corey. He's actually been on the podcast, so I got a chance to meet him. And I've actually got a chance to meet him a couple of times on the campaign trail. He is a genuinely amazing person. And he has a really amazing story as well. I think y'all would y'all would have so much to talk about if y'all got to meet it comes through to, to me, him being an amazing person and such a genuine person. It comes through even on TV. Mm-hmm. All right. So next question. What was the hardest part about writing a book? The hardest part was uh, starting. Oh, lacing up those shoes. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> and, and, and And trying to figure out how to do it because I knew I wanted to do it. And I had collected the stories and I held on to them for a while. And then I own my own business where I would go out and do training and was leadership project management. And I met a a woman that helped publish books. I said, this is it. So I I needed help. I didn't know how to go about doing it. And I found the help to help me do that. Yeah. I will say that I've had many book ideas, but I have not written a book yet. So I know that getting started part is definitely the hill that you have to get over the hump. <laughs> All right. So what's your favorite thing to do on a weekend? I have been so busy recently in our weekends, but I like to travel and my travels include museums. Uh, again, I, I'm a history buff. So if I can take a trip and go to a museum or see something new, then that's that's my favorite thing to do. I love museums too. I recently went to DC and I have been to DC many times. But there's so many museums in D.C. that you can never run out of museums to go to. So I always love finding a good museum when I go there. All right. Next question. What's the most interesting historical fact or event that you learned about when you were researching for your book? Going back to uh, the the Civil War piece, and I don't remember the exact quote, but Lincoln, uh, along with... um, General Ulysses S. Grant agreed that allowing Black soldiers into the Union Army is what turned the war. Oh, wow. And so, and that, again, is why I say we should celebrate the ending of the war and Juneteenth is so important. Wow. That's amazing. I know uh, when you're a history buff, it's really hard to try to like find like your favorite thing Mm -hmm. or the most interesting thing, but that is a really good one. So Penny, that is actually the end of our rapid fire questions. You did a great job. Thank you. And so um, probably the, I don't know, easiest or hardest question of all, where can people go to find out more about you and your work? Well, now that I am the new program director for Virginia and Red Wine and Blue, you can go to Red Wine and Blue. All right. So redwine.blue, and they'll be able to find out more about you, your work, and um, uh, information about the book will also be available in the show notes. So Penny, this was so great. Thank you so much for joining us on the Suburban Women Problem. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Jasmine, that was a great interview. Penny Blue is such a cute name. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. It's the best name ever. I know. It is a cute name. I really like the name. I also really enjoyed my conversation with her because I don't think that a lot of people tie like what happened in our past. Oh my God. And historically things that have happened to what's happening right now today. But I think that's what I like, like the connection to the school board, to the school, you know, especially as you guys talked about, about, you know, during integration, during those times, like, okay, we can take a breath. We've done this before. We got through it. I mean, although not perfectly. It was, yeah. And, and that was <laughs> what she, we did get through it. And I think that is a good outlook on it. But I mean, she really did talk about also just like how tough it was to go through yeah. it before and just seeing echoes of that now. But I also think when we think about the curriculum, and how they're trying to change curricula. One of the things that I think about is the fact that they don't really want people to be able to see those parallels yeah, because then they can recognize the bad thing, but they can also recognize how to move forward from the bad things. And they will remember how we overcame, at least in that iteration of the same, Mm -hmm. you know, same Mm -hmm. story, different decade. But uh, I I do think that that is intentional when it comes to how people go after history Mm -hmm. in the curriculum. Absolutely. It is my hope that one day we stop the cycle and we do not have to repeat history or the ugly parts of history. But again, you know, I left that conversation inspired that there is so much work that we can do to you know, move forward. And that's why I'm so glad she's joining Red Wine and Blue in Virginia. And I I think she's going to be an amazing addition to all the work that Red Wine and Blue is already doing in other states in the country. All right. So with that, I think it is a good time for us to transition to our toast to joy. And so Rachel, I'm going to start with you. What's something amazing or great that's been going on with you in this last week? Um, I am very proud to announce that my husband and myself and my daughter all finished sixth grade and we passed. Yay. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> hey, that's big. It's big. Yes, it was the second time for Alex and me, but um, the first time for our daughter. So uh, it was a bit challenging and definitely, um, you know, new school, an actual final situation where there were exams and projects and more projects, and more projects. And, um, but hey, we survived. And I am very hopeful for how we're going to perform in seventh grade. So uh, Ellie is at camp, we are child free, trying to get some stuff done. But my toast of joy is to passing sixth grade and camp. Woo, parents gone wild. (laughs) (laughs) Amanda, what is your toast to joy this week? So my toast joy is I got to go to a conference in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which Grand Rapids was very cute. I was pleasantly surprised. I've heard good things about Grand Rapids. It's so, I don't know what I was expecting. I guess I just wasn't expecting anything. I showed them like, oh, so cute. Look at this little river and this cute little downtown. But at this conference, my student, um, an undergraduate, got a student award for her research, even competing against the graduate students. And... I was so excited. Um, And it's a conference I love because it's really about how do we connect research to the real world, to policy, to make communities better. And she is doing that research. And I am so proud of her. And it was really awesome. So my toast to joy was to all of the researchers out there, including my students who are connecting that to make their communities better. Ah, I love that. I mean, that is really, I think something we struggle with in the United States Mm -hmm. and we have like this class system, but like there's this thought of like, there's all this academic work and work in academia, but what does that mean for real people in the real world to be able to connect that and put it into policy that makes people's lives better is really important. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that I think is, is like the norm. So that's, that's pretty exciting. hundred yeah. percent. So there's a book called The Engaged Scholar by um, Andrew Hoffman, which is basically that, that we, in an age of misinformation, academics and people doing research have a real role to play, but you have to start talking to everybody. <laughs> you can't just talk to your silos. And I know every organization has silo issues, but we have to really talk to people wherever people are at. If that is social media, if that is in a bar, 
<laughs> I'll go to a bar and have a drink and talk econ with people. I don't, <laughs> but we have to talk to real people and it matters. And it really matters right now when we're dealing with lots of misinformation. All right, Jasmine, what is your toast to joy? So my toast to joy is kind of a little bit similar to yours, Amanda, except for um, I didn't travel. I was in Atlanta, but um, our uh, legislative black caucus held their young leaders conference. And I got a chance to be one of the speakers during the conference. And so the young leaders conference was for high school students. So we had kids as young as eighth grade going into ninth grade, all the way up to a couple of students who are incoming freshmen in their uh, college years. And it was just, it was amazing to to have some great conversations with some students that I am 100% convinced Mm -hmm. I'll probably be voting for one day. Mm -hmm. Um, But just this idea that it's this theme that the youth are actually engaging and they're listening and they want to have a seat at the table and they want their voices to be heard and to see it in action. It was amazing. It was inspiring to me. I do wish that I had invited my daughter. I didn't think about it because she was in eighth grade. So I didn't think, oh, well, she could go because she's going into high school. But I definitely know that she will be a part of it next year because I really do think that we need to go ahead and prepare those young minds to be those bold voices. And um, they're there. They, they have the words. They have the feelings. Um, a lot of times they just need to know the right people and have the tools mm-hmm. to to get out there and uh, do what they need to do to make the world a better place for themselves and for the people that will come after them. But I'm just, it was just inspiring. So I loved the opportunity to talk with those kids and I look forward to future opportunities to continue to engage our next leaders. Mm. Oh, I love that. I, whenever I see young people, I'm like, they are fighters and they are kind and they fight in a way that I think we are going to be so excited to see yes. in the future. I'm very Agree. hopeful when, whenever I am around young people, I am eternally hopeful. Agree. 100%. All right. So thanks so much to everyone for joining us today. We're coming up on the one year anniversary of the Dobbs decision. And right now we're gathering stories of women who were inspired to take action after the fall of Roe. And it doesn't have to be something big. Every action counts. So I'm trying to think of like something that I did different after the fall of Roe. Obviously, I'm in politics, so I've tried really hard at the political level to, you know, push back against um, anti-reproductive freedom stuff. But that's not the only thing that people can do. Can y'all think of other things, like things that maybe y'all have done? I shared my story of my ectopic pregnancy um, and the emergency surgery that resulted afterwards. I mean, it's not something that I talk about every day, but I think it's important. um, It is. To talk about it, to say what, what could happen now with these very restrictive laws, because Um, You know, as I mentioned several times, I was in surgery, like, you know, being operated on within 30 minutes of arriving at a routine doctor's appointment because my physician realized there was something seriously wrong. And um, I I just thought I was having a normal miscarriage and it turned out to be something just really serious. So I think sometimes sharing our stories um, and being willing to share the what if, if, you know, that if things hadn't turned out like that can be very powerful for all of us because it is a personal story. And when you're sharing that with someone, with a loved one, with a friend, you are someone that's very relatable. They already have trust in you and they know you. And it's much different than hearing a story from a stranger. That's a good point. It doesn't have to be sharing your story on a wide platform like Facebook and all that stuff. Maybe it's you shared your story with someone that's close to you that has kind of parroted a lot of this anti-abortion rhetoric and you finally decided, hey, I'm going to tell them my story. And since they know me, maybe they will understand that the things that they're saying just aren't true. I would say kind of related to that, something that I try and make sure to do is to lift up the stories of other women. When If I don't personally have a story that It is so easy to say, this is a really important story. I think other people should hear this woman's story. And I'm going to share this with my friends or on Twitter or in a message. 
that I want you to hear this story. It's an important story. It might not be my story. So it might be Rachel's story or Jasmine's story or someone else's story, but I think it is so easy. And something extra I do is always make sure to try and lift up the voices of other people who have important stories that we need to share. And so my story, like all of our stories, you know, is different. So after the fall of Roe, I agreed to go on a podcast and talk about kind of my, in a little more detail, my journey about my feelings on abortion. And it was with a group of women who had very, you know, who had different feelings on abortion and, um, you know, being very honest that I've come quite, quite a ways on my views on abortion. And even when I was talking with some of them, like, well, like you didn't believe there should be abortion in no cases. And I'm like, I did, I did believe that. That is something that I believed. I have come quite a ways from there. And part of it is hearing the stories, like reading the real stories of women. I were told things about women that just were untrue. But when I started hearing more stories that were real, I realized some of the things I was told were untrue. And that I think that that's important to hear too, that you can maybe have a conversation with someone and move them, even someone that you thought you would not be able to move. And I think that is also an important story to share that, you know, we can have these tough conversations and we can do it in a way that is loving and kind the way a lot of our young people do. And we can move people that way. Cause I know that is how I was moved on this issue. Mm, that's so nice. Absolutely. So if Dobbs helped you find your voice too, we'd love to hear your story. You can share it by going to go.redwine.blue slash Dobbs, or by clicking the link in the show notes. I think it's going to be so inspiring to hear from everyone about how they're stepping up and getting involved. So with that, we'll see you next week on another episode of the Suburban Women Problem. The Suburban Women Problem was created by Red, Wine, and Blue. Our producer and editor is Amy Thorstenson, and our project manager is Lindsay Quist. Videos by Abigail Martin and Ashley Hufford. For more information about upcoming events and trainings, or to learn more about Red Wine and Blue, follow us on social media or at www.redwine.blue.